Let's go ahead and have our seats. All right, I just want to say thank you to Chuck for that word. That uh, I think that was very timely and uh, very encouraging. Um, I also want to let you know, for those of you who may not be aware, that uh, typically, I'm looking around for now, I don't see it, but typically um, they do a set. Are they doing the set tonight? You know? Okay. Typically we have a, a worship set that happens after EGS is concluded. Uh, that starts at 10 o'clock and goes from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock. So if you want to burn the midnight oil and, uh, and just stay and worship the Lord, you're invited to do that tonight. So um, I want to just encourage you and just sort of tag on a little bit what uh, Chuck was saying. There's no problem that you have that's bigger than God. No problem that you have that's bigger than God. No family thing that passed down to you is bigger than the king. Okay? No lack of education. No insufficiency of finances. No physical malady. There's nothing that you face that's bigger than God. Sometimes we deal with timing issues. We deal with, you know... Uh, talk to a gentleman today who's been struggling with some back issues for three years. He injured his back uh, and has been in unrelenting pain for three years. And uh, nothing touches it. No medicine, nothing. Believer in God. Why do these things happen? I don't know. Why does your problem happen? I don't know. You know, we have a tendency to think that if we could just figure out why, and that would, that would be it. That would be the answer. But it's not necessarily the answer. What we do know is who the answer is. And I know these are things that we've all heard before. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. But I want to stir up your faith tonight to believe God. Don't stop believing. Jesus said those words, didn't he? He said, ask. Well, actually, it says it this way. It says, you have not because you ask not. And then how many have said to the Lord, but I've been asking? <laughs> okay? You have not because you ask not. Okay, I asked. Well, then Jesus came with the, the scripture that says it this way. He said, ask and keep on asking. Knock and keep on knocking. Keep on ask, seek, knock. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Don't stop. Do you know what? It's better to live a life of faith and seeking and asking and go into heaven having never received your promise than to check out and say, I'm done. I'm telling you, it's a better life. It, I'm saying, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm bold about this, if you never get what you're asking for, you're better to keep on asking. These all died in faith, having not received the promise it was a good life. They don't regret it. They're in heaven today, so I'm glad I lived that way. I'm glad I didn't check out five years earlier because I was tired of asking. So how can it be better? Because your answer is not as important as your journey. Amen. That's the thing we don't get. That's right. We'd skip right to the answer, wouldn't we? How many would skip right to the answer? <laughs> I'd skip right to the answer. It's like, let's just get out of the wilderness into the prophecy. All right. Uh, if you want to follow along in your scriptures, you can. I'm not going to hold you a long time. I, I just, I felt uh, very inclined of the Lord tonight to remind you of some things that perhaps you um, at one time knew or maybe haven't uh, looked at it in a while. I want to talk about the cross tonight. How many love the cross? How many love the Bible? You love the Bible. You better love the Bible. I'm telling you right now. Yeah, Jesus said it this way. He said, you know, you think that I'm going to judge you on that day. How many knows there is still something known as the final judgment? Okay? It's because our culture doesn't like it. It hasn't gone away. It's still going to happen one day. You're still going to... It says we must all... Or let me, let me quote it right. It's appointed unto men and women 
wants to die. No, sorry, but I think we all been dying. And after that, what? For judgment. Can't get away from it. It's the one appointment we all have. But it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And Jesus said it this way. He said, you think that I am going to judge you in that day. He said, no. He said, I will not judge you, but the words that I have spoken, they will be your judge in that day. So in other words, the Lord has already laid out why. Because he said, here are my words, they are life. They're not death to us. The words of the Lord are good. Yeah, they are. They're really good. Okay, it's good news, right? How many remember the word gospel means good news? His words are good. Even the ones that have a little bit of an ouch on them. You know? You've ever had the Lord whisper something to you and pray and have a little bit of the ouch on it? But it's like, it's still good. Yay. How many would like Jesus to stand in front of you and say, I can't point to you, but, you know, you messed up. <laughs> Moving away. Can't find a place for my, can I point to you? Okay. No, no, for real. What if the Lord came into your bedroom tonight, stood at your, at the end of your bed and said, you know, I love you, but you're messing up in this area. Would you spend the rest of your life regretting that he came to you? Right. Heavens no. Why? Because we know everything he says and everything he brings and everything he does is good. It's good. You can take the volume of everything Jesus has said and wrap it up in one big bundle of good and go, yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, that one has a little bit of ouch on, but that's good too. That's good. That's good. It's all good. It's all good. Okay, so we're going to look at a few of those words tonight. I want you to put your hand on your heart. Let's just uh, talk to him. Let's close our eyes for a second or whatever you want to do. Let's just... Lord, we're, we're really, really happy to, to serve you. We're really grateful for the things you said and the things you've done. All the things that you began to do and to teach. Or thank you that you're here in this room. Thank you for the exhortations, the songs, the way you touched us tonight. Thank you. What a privileged people we are. As we look into your word, I pray for divine revelation. Open our eyes. Spirit of wisdom and revelation. We pray, as the apostle taught us, we ask for the spirit of wisdom. Your spirit of wisdom, come in the room. Reveal, open our eyes. Give us revelation, the unveiling of things we cannot normally see. Spirit of wisdom and unveiling, revelation, come. Holy Spirit, reveal to us. We need each of us personal things. I pray as we look in your word that the checklist will just get checked off in our lives. Talk to us, Jesus. Lord, some of us have come looking for answers tonight, would you give us those answers? And would you increase our love for you, God? In the end, that we will love you more. And we'll have more passion for you, not just for the stuff that you can give to us, but for you. Forgive us, Lord, for sometimes we're always seeking stuff. And you want to be sought. You want us to seek you. So we want that. Forgive us when we get uh, sidetracked, confused, and distracted. Help us to see you and to love you. Let's read your word in Jesus' name. Okay, Matthew 10, 38. This is the requirement of the cross. Um, I don't know if I'll get through all of these, but um, I think there's about 15, 18, something like that here. And this is just a smattering of what's in the scripture. From time to time, I want to encourage you to anchor yourself in the words of God. Okay? I don't know if you've considered what a great gift the, the re recorded word, the written word of, of the Lord is. I mean, think of the benefit. I've been going through our history and uh, compiling uh, a record of what the Lord has done uh, for us over the last decade. And to go back and read words that people have said, that I have said, that prophetic voices have said, dreams. I mean, for, for a person to state something 
and I know I'm being a little philosophical here, but to simply write down on a piece of paper. Okay? To simply write down what someone says on a piece of paper so that it can be looked at a hundred years, a thousand years from now, is dramatic. Imagine where we would be if we did not have that concerning our Lord. If no one ever took the time to capture something he said, make sure they got it right, and put it down on a piece of papyrus or, or whatever they wrote on some kind of paper, because that has been passed down, 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 now you and I get to look at it. I want to encourage you to take time. Once in a while, think of a phrase, think of a, a, um, a subject like the cross, and use the gifting. I'm sure God didn't give us computers for Facebook. I know that's hard to maybe wrap your mind around. But I think there are good things he gave us our technology for. And one of the good things is how you can cross-reference things in the Bible. I mean, if you haven't gotten on like one of the many Bible search engines and just did a word search and just and run through the Bible, everything it says about a subject. Not only is it fascinating, it's encouraging, it's strengthening. Because the words of the Lord are life. Okay? They can change how you think about things, which will change how you react to things. You know, we are a product of what we believe, and we believe according to the stuff that goes into us. So take the time. Go deep in the Word of God. You need the anchor of His Word in these last days. How many believe we're in the last days? I have a good authority that we have been for 2,000 years. How many know what I'm talking about? Okay, who said that? Who was the first guy to say that? Okay, Peter. Okay, right after uh, on the we're on the day of Pentecost, what did he say? He said, "This is that." They're all speaking in tongues. Everyone's flipping out. They're all crazy. These people are drunk. Why is it that we always go to drunk? You know, whenever something crazy happens. No, they said these people are drunk, and he said, "No, they're not drunk." He said, "This is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel in the last days." So Peter tagged that moment as the beginning of the last days. Here's just this little problem for us. Last days is like 20 days, you know, maybe 30 days, 100 days. That's stretching. For God, you know, it's been 2,000 years. So 365 times 2,000, whatever, you know, that's a lot of last days, right? Okay, but that's how he sees it. You know, day with the Lord is what? 1,000 years, 1,000 years a day. He makes an apology for that, okay? So we are in the last days, and if we're in the last days, we have been given a lot of instructions specific to the day that we live in. How many know that? You know, there are over 180, hear this now, chapters in the Bible that deal with the end of days. So that's not God just throwing a little bit now and then just to satisfy some curiosity conspiracy guys. That's the Lord saying, oh no, you're going to need this more than you can possibly understand. So, I know I take a long time in this, but when I say anchor yourself in the Word of God, go deep in the Word of God, I really mean it. You really need to do it. You really need to open up the dusty pages of that book and dive into it again and ask God for revelation. Okay, here we go. Matthew 10, 38. Call this the requirement of the cross. <clears throat> Jesus speaks. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. A general statement given to not only the disciples, but to everyone. See the word he who does not, in some translations it says whosoever. So the idea is that this applies to everyone and anyone. Now, let's before we go into the cross, let's just do a little bit of background work. You and I have heard the phrase, the cross, so many times, it doesn't have the same impact to us that it would have in this century that Jesus lived. Okay? Why? Because it wasn't used in this kind of terminology at all. This was bizarre language to these people. Now the cross was a tool of execution. You're all aware of that. It's a Roman tool of execution. But people didn't go around talking about the cross as some kind of metaphor. Okay? It was very unusual for them to say that. So imagine... This man, Jesus, showing up on the scene, and their minds are starting to kind of unfold to the reality that he's not normal. 
Okay? There's something different about, okay? He knows what we're thinking. He is like speaking to fig trees and they're drying up and falling over. Uh, he is, you know, taking cords and whipping people out of the temple. I mean, you know, he's touching blind people. I heard about this dead guy the other day that got out of the ground. It's crazy, you know, I wasn't there. But you know what I'm saying? They're starting to like, you know, we get this image of Jesus sort of floating, you know, 10 inches off the ground and just, oh, 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 oh coming through the land and everybody's falling over, you know, the Son of God. No, no, no. He shows up like you and I and he starts manifesting the kingdom through his life and gradually people are starting to really awaken. Now there's some people that awoke sooner, I don't, I don't mean to diminish it, but for, so imagine somebody, a preacher coming on the scene and starting to talk about execution. Not a Sunday morning subject. Okay? If anyone doesn't follow me and take up his tool of execution, he cannot be my disciple. Those are bizarre words. I mean, I want you to think about it. See what I'm saying? For you, you've heard them a million times, right? They don't have that impact to you. When I, we talk about the cross, I mean, we've been so inundated with the cross. You know, Karen, you get your cross, we wear the cross, we see the, the cross in every church, you know. The cross is a phrase and it's a terminology, it's an idea that's ingrained, it wasn't ingrained in them. For them, what they associated the cross with was something that was like unspeakable. The Roman cross was a form of execution and it was the worst one they'd ever devised up until that time. Period. I, temp I was tempted to uh, take a few moments and watch some of the Passion of the Christ. How many have seen that movie? From everything I've ever read, they said there's no way you could overstate the, uh, the intensity of what happens in that scenario. It is absolutely horrifying what they do. So again, imagine Jesus showing up and saying, to a bunch of people whose only grid for the cross is this horrifying thing that they may or may not have seen and definitely probably heard about that the Romans did to some of their prisoners who were really, really bad. And Jesus, Son of God, loving Lamb, you know, kissing babies, healing sick folk, <laughs> is talking about, what? What are you talking? You can't, you can't I, we can't follow you unless we take up our cross? What the heck are you talking about? Do you get what I'm saying? Okay, so this was not nice, nice talk for them. This was revolutionary. This was extreme. This was not something they expected to come out of the Lamb of God's mouth. Okay? So when he says, he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Now Matthew chapter 10, he had not really revealed that this is where he was going. So add to that, okay, now it'd be one thing if they were two days before the cross and everybody was starting to kind of get it into their head that he was headed for the cross. I mean, even then, only a few people really got it. Even his disciples mostly didn't get it. But even if it was right before the time he was to go to the cross, they still did not quite say that. It says they didn't quite get the fact that he was going to go to the cross. A few of them did. Mary, she did. She anointed with oil and all that. But most of them, they were still kind of, this was way, way, way before that. Maybe possibly even a couple of years. So this is way out of the blue for him to st start talking about going to the cross. Now, what does that mean for you and I? Well, the cross means the same thing for you and I that it meant for him. You know, one of the problems in our world today is that we have diminished the requirement of discipleship. To be a disciple of Jesus, the starting point, the gateway for discipleship is your old life gets to die. Okay? We don't ask Jesus to come into the mix and fix up our life. We go to the cross and we die with him. How many knows it says that in the scripture? I am, Paul said, crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Jesus said it right here from the other angle, not as one who needed to do it, but one who was going to do it himself. If you're going to follow me and be my disciple, you have got to die. That's what he was saying. He wasn't saying you need to wear a cross around your neck. Okay. He wasn't saying you need to go to church without a cross upon the steeple. That's not what he was saying. 
I want you to understand the bizarreness of it because he was throwing it down right here. He was dropping the mic. I'm not going to do it. Okay? He was throwing it down. He was saying, if you're going to follow me, it's going to require the end of everything you were before you started following me. Now, what does that look like? Well, it looked like different things to different people. For some people, they literally lost everything. The Apostle Paul, now here's something you may not know about Paul. The scripture says, or he said, his testimony, he says, I have lost everything. That's bad grammar. He didn't say it that way. How do you say it? <laughs> he said, I, I have suffered the loss. Thank you. I didn't get my King James language here. I have suffered the loss of all things. But it did mean he lost everything. For the sake of Christ. How many know that's in the Bible? Okay? Suffered the loss of everything. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And a Pharisee had to be at least 30, I think it was 33 years old, or maybe just 30, 30 years old, 33 is when Jesus died. A Pharisee had to be 30 years old, he had to be the husband of one wife, and he had to have at least two children. Now you don't hear about this from Paul, but it is very likely that the Apostle Paul, almost assuredly, that he was married, and that he had at least two kids. And you never hear about him in the Gospel. Don't think for a minute that people haven't left everything to follow Jesus. I say, oh, that's extreme. No, that's your culture. That's your culture you live in that says God would never do that. It says right there in that Bible, Jesus said, if you, don't, if you come to me, you don't hate your father, your mother, your brother, your sister more than me, you're not worthy of me. I have tried my best to expunge that from the scripture. Because I'm like, Lord, you didn't really say that, did you? And he's like, yes, I did. You know what he's really saying? He's saying there's nothing that is higher than eternal life. There is nothing that's more important than you fulfilling your destiny of walking with me. You can have the whole world. What will it profit if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? And the whole world means people, it means jobs, it means education, it means comfort, it means anything. I know, that's tough preaching, isn't it? When was the last time you heard somebody talk about, you know, those scriptures so far buried in our psyche, we don't even know they're there anymore. And yet they are there. Jesus, this man, see, we don't come on our terms. We don't come and, and make a deal with God and say, here's how we do it. We come on his terms. We take his word and we say, yes, sir, I will do what you say in that scripture because I want to be your disciple. Now, is he mean? Is he hard? Is he harsh? No. But he knows what it takes to get through to us. So the power of the cross is, starts with what a cross does, and that's that it kills you. Okay? How many want to die? Come on. Does this sound like the gospel that you used to hear? Here's the gospel that we preach in America. I know I'm, I'm this is I <laughs> no, nobody's gonna want to come back next Friday. Okay, that's all right. I know. I'm not gonna make apologies for what it says in the scripture. And I'm not gonna hide it either because it's unpleasant. I don't preach on it every time, but I today is the day. Jesus said, come to me, take up your cross, lay everything down, fall after me. Our culture today says, go to church, be a good person, sing songs, and you're in. Say this prayer, we've got this four-step prayer. You know, God loves you, he has a wonderful plan for your life. How many of you ever prayed that prayer? I've led people in that prayer. It's a good prayer. But it falls short of really what he's asking. All right, let's go back to the Word of God. Matthew 16, 24. Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him, what? Deny himself. Let him, what? Take up his cross. There's that dead thing again. Again, wrap your mind around the fact that that was a bizarre statement in, the, in uh, this century. Bizarre statement to them. Okay? Take up your cross, and then what's the third thing? Follow me. Do you know what the power of the cross is? The power of the cross is a selfless life. The power of the cross says, my life is not mine. How many are glad that Jesus went to the cross for you? Do you realize that he did not go to the cross for his own sake, but he went to the cross for yours? How many of you are willing to lay your life down for others? That's the cross. That's the cross. It's the upside down kingdom. 
How many would be willing to say, you know what, I'm going to do what Jesus did. I'm going to go and I'm going to lay my life down for people who don't know me. My first response, uh-uh. Can't do it. But you know, if the one that did that is living on the inside of you, you can say yes. You can say yes. I'd be willing to lay my life down for somebody I don't even know. I was reading a book the other day called Peace Child. Anybody ever read that book? Yes. Older book. It's about uh, some missionaries that went to, uh, to Africa. And oh my gosh, you just can't believe the things that they were willing to do to see these people come to the Lord. Or Bruce Olson. Anybody ever read the book Bruco? It was a classic missionary book uh, for years and years about a young man, 16 years old. He prays to the Lord and says, would you be my God? He's to Jesus. says, Jesus, would you be my God? <laughs> What a brilliant prayer. And he buys a one-way ticket to Columbia and he spends the rest of his life in Columbia winning this group of people to him, or to the Lord, not to him, but to Jesus. And now the whole tribe, generation after generation, has followed the Lord and served the Lord because somebody laid their life down. That's the cross. That's the power of the cross. It's the power to change lives. Okay, let's look at John 19. The king on the cross. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. So the cross is the place where kings go. How many are kings and priests of the Lord? Yeah? The kings go to the cross. They embrace the cross. I'm about to hurry. John 19, 19. Authorities recognize the power of the cross. Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth. The king of the Jews. Secular, ungodly powers recognize the power of the cross. Do you know what man's ultimate need is? The death of self. The cross is the ultimate picture of selflessness. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave. Didn't take. It's not what's in it for me. Is how can I give away? For God so loved the world that he gave it all away. Self, oh, I'm, I'm trying to think of the other scripture. Uh, no greater love has any man than this. What's the rest of it? That he laid down his life. No greater love. Do you know why the cross is so powerful? You see, the cross wasn't a place where somebody was taken advantage of. How many know that? Okay. So people ask often, they say, well, why did Jesus, who put Jesus on the cross? Who's responsible? Imagine if Jesus was crucified in today's world. They would have a, you know, they'd have a, a committee. <laughs> they would start an investigation. You know, who's responsible for this? Who's to blame for this? Well, the Romans were to blame for it, right? It was their tool of death, right? I mean, that's true. I mean, they, you know, Pilate, Roman, he's the one that pronounced it. Okay. What about the Jews? Were they responsible? Yeah, they were. Why? Well, they were out there saying, crucify him. That that's bears some level of responsibility, right? Okay. Do you know who's really responsible for Jesus' death on the cross? You and me. I had a conversation with somebody once, and they asked the question. They said, well, who's, you know, whose fault? Who's, who? Who's responsible for Jesus' death? I said, you are. <laughs> what? No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Why? Because he willingly lived. And this is the ultimate thing. You know who's ultimately more responsible even more than you and I? Him. He willingly laid his life down. And see, this is the essence of the cross. Nobody can take you to the cross. No one can make you embrace the life of the cross. Nobody can force you to come to the cross. The one thing that you must realize about the cross is that no man can command the cross. Even though Jesus says, if you don't do it, you can't be my disciple. In the spirit of the Lord, it's voluntary. It's voluntary. Jesus said when he was on his way to the cross, what were the words he uttered? He said, no man takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. When he was standing face to face with Pilate, Pilate said, Aren't you going to answer me anything? 
He said, Behold the man. And they looked at him and they, and he, and they said, uh, We have no king but Caesar. Crucify him, crucify him. And he came back and he says, Are you uh, the king of Israel? And so on. And he says, He said, Aren't you going to answer me to him? Don't you know that I have the power to crucify you or I have the power to let you go? And what did Jesus say? He says, You have no power at all against me. Wow. Do you understand that, that when we embrace voluntarily the life of the cross, that we get partnership with him. We get partnership with Jesus. The very benefits of the cross are ours when we embrace it with it. When we say voluntarily yes to the cross, then the benefits that come with the cross are ours. Let me, uh, let's go on and then we'll get to that here in just a minute. Uh, John 19, 25, women embrace the cross. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of uh, Cl Clopas, that's a funny name, and Mary Magdalene. Okay, so the scripture highlights the fact that women were one of the first ones to stand by, identify with the cross, and say yes to the cross. John 19, 31, the cross is empty. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, and the body should not remain on the Sabbath, on the cross on the Sabbath, for so that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that the legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. Okay, the cross is now empty. Aren't you glad for that? Jesus embraced the cross. He died and then he, what? He rose again. Now it's our turn. 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 18. This is a powerful verse, uh, two verses here. The power of the message of the cross. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message of the cross is two things. It's foolishness and it's the power of God. Those are complete opposites, aren't they? Okay? So who determines the effectiveness or the lack of the effectiveness of the message of the cross? That would be you and I. The message of the cross is to those who are perishing, that's people, foolishness. But it is to those who are being saved, the message of the cross is what? The power of God. The same message can have effect or no effect depending on the person who's hearing it and the person who's receiving it. The message of the cross is the power. How many want it to be the power of God in your life? Yeah, amen. All right, Galatians 5.11. The liberty of the cross is offensive. And I, brothers, if I still preach circumcision, why do I suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. What is the offense of the cross? The offense, look what it says. It says, if I, brothers, preach circumcision, in other words, salvation that comes through human effort, the cross is powerless at that point. The cross, the message of the cross and the idea of the cross is that it is offensive because it shifts righteousness to another man's deeds instead of to yours. How many still struggle with that? Come on. The message of the cross. Look at it again. The liberty of the cross, it says, And I, brothers, if I still preach circumcision, this Paul saying, if I still preach that the way to salvation is through your flesh, why, am I, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. Actually, clarify, let's look at the next page, the next verse. Galatians 6 and 12 says it this way, As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution... For what? For the cross. The cross nullifies the requirements of the flesh. Your righteousness and your right standing with God is now based on another man's good works. Your right standing with God is based on the fact that Jesus went to the cross. That's an offensive thing to the flesh, isn't it? How can that be? 
How can it be that one man's deeds make my life righteous? Anybody struggle with that? Come on, I can't be the only one who struggles with that. Yeah, saved by grace. Listen, we are either saved because of the cross or we're saved because of our own good works. Are we to do good works? Absolutely. There is no excuse for doing evil things, period. Okay, I want to make that very clear. There is no excuse for doing evil, ever. But there is forgiveness. Yeah? And there is grace. Yeah? And your ability to have a right relationship with God is not based on the fact that you're living right. It's on the cross. It's on another man's sacrifice. That's the offense of the cross. That's what Paul preached as the offense of the cross. In his day, doing right was circumcision. It was the Torah. It was keeping the 630 laws of the Torah. And Paul said, no. That if salvation comes through works, then he said the sacrifice of Jesus is in vain. Why does that matter? Because you're either going to spend the rest of your life in the mode of failure and success and having a relationship based on your current failure or your current success, or you're going to accept the fact that Jesus covered all your sins and start walking with Him in victory. That's what the devil doesn't want. Say, so yeah, but doesn't that, won't that like breed passivity and, and like loose living in my life? Well, I've never met anyone where it really has. Because it's really tough to embrace this loving relationship with Jesus. And, con you know, I like how Mike Bickle uh, said it. He said, the problem is with us people who are, are uh, disciples of Jesus. He says, every time we go to sin, we have this big stumbling block in our way that we really love Jesus. There isn't any greater motivator for nearness to God than loving Him. There really isn't. Striving for perfection. And striving to be someone who always lives up to an ideal and a standard that's impossible to live up to is not the, uh, it's not the way to have a happy life. Jesus created, provided through the cross, a means whereby we could live in close relationship to Him while we're working out our salvation with fear and trembling. How many know that's in the Bible too? See, the problem, the offense in this is the struggle that's always going through our mind all the time. Well, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Yeah, but if you do that, then you're going to, yeah, but if you believe that, then aren't you going to, I don't. You know, the platform that I have to love Jesus is the cross. It's the thing, Bob, that I keep coming back to over and over. And you know, let me just give you a little clarification here. I don't care how righteous you are in the natural. You're always going to be unrighteous. You may think you've got all the boxes checked. I promise you, you don't. You're going to slip up in your speech. You're going to slip up in your thought life. You're going to slip up in the way you treat your friends and neighbors. You're going to slip up in your own personal now, I am not the guy that says, so don't worry about it. Because I don't believe that either. I think that we are supposed to be wanting to be like Jesus. If you ever stop that, and you no longer want to be like Him, then it's like, what's the point? I want to be like Him. It's not some impossible dream. I believe that with His Spirit on the inside of me, I can be like Him. Yes. That's, the, that's part of the good news. You know, the good news is not just that I'm forgiven from sin, I also have power over it. Come on. Yeah. That's the twofold good news. It's not just deliverance from the penalty of sin, it's also deliverance from the power of sin. That's good news. But how many know it's also a process? The three P's. Penalty, power, and process. Okay? But it's all based on the finished work of the cross. It's because he went to the cross that you have a platform of grace to stand upon while you're aiming towards him. While you're moving towards him. And when you stumble, and you will stumble, you don't need anyone's permission to stumble. If every preacher in the world stood up and told you you should never ever stumble, you'd still stumble. 
because that's who we are. But we've got this platform that we can aim towards him and move towards him, and we don't have to walk in condemnation, and the devil hates that. <clears throat> you know, the worst thing about life is not messing up. Walking in shame and condemnation is a heck of a lot worse. How many know what I'm talking about? Shame and condemnation will kill you quicker than just about anything you do. You know why? Because it causes you to give up hope. It'll cause you to quit trying. What comes right on the, the tail of, of shame and condemnation? Give up. What's the point? How many of you have not ever heard that? You know, that's one of the enemy's primary strategies. Get you feeling bad enough about your mistakes, bad enough about... And let's not think about big sins. Let's just, maybe it's just, you know, you just trying to be close to the Lord, whatever it is. Trying to make you feel bad enough about your inadequacies that you don't try anymore. Because I will guarantee you, when you go passive with God, you know what happens when you do nothing? <laughs> Big fat zero. Okay? Somebody said, oh, so an amazing thing happens when you do nothing. Nothing. Okay? This, this Christian life is not about just saying, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. That is not what the Christian life is about. But that's one extreme. But the other extreme is shame, brokenness. No, brokenness is not the right word. But guilt, condemnation, shame, keeping you dragged down. You get what I'm saying? The cross is meant to give you something to look to. And can you handle this? Not just the bad times, but the good times. You know, we need to learn to look to the cross when we're doing good, too. You know why? Because when we're doing bad, you get overwhelmed with shame. When you're doing good, you get overwhelmed with pride. You need to learn to look at the cross in the good times, too, and go, I'm not all that in a bag of chips. It's it. It's it. Looking unto Jesus. Fixing our eyes upon Jesus. Hebrews 12 and 2. Looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, what he what was he looking forward to? We're looking forward to him, he was looking forward to us. That's a whole other subject right there. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame. Jesus had every reason to let shame engulf him while he was hanging naked on a cross, being made a public display. He had every reason to allow shame to overwhelm him, but he refused to do it. When it says he despised the shame, it means he rejected it. He saw it for what it was. He says, you know what? You know, I was, I was riding in the car today. I was um, at the post office, and someone did me wrong. <laughs> and it started to rise up in me. So where's my brother Johnny? I need some beat down power. <laughs> and the Lord, he just like grabbed me right there. And he said, you know, I didn't say that that it was wrong to be angry unless you have a good reason for it. You know what I'm saying? We kind of justify, yeah, but this and this and this. In other words, I have a right. Anybody ever do that? I have a right. Okay? I have a right to be bitter. I'm going to embrace my bitterness. I have a right. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know how they treated me. I, I have a right to feel condemned. You don't know what I've been doing. Well, I have a right to feel sad. You don't know what happened to me. Do you know why the Lord said you don't have a right to do those things even if they're legitimate? Because they're still not good for you. Okay? That feeling of anger that I was feeling at that person at that moment, who happened to be in another car, blocking my way, <coughs> it wasn't like, you know what, Jim, if you don't have a reason to be angry, it's really unhealthy for you to be, but if you do have a reason to be angry, it's okay. It's not going to affect you badly because you have a good reason to be. 
You get what I'm saying? It's like the Lord said, the reason is irrelevant. It's the consequence of your, your acts. You get what I'm saying? That's why he said to forgive, even if a person doesn't deserve to be forgiven. I, uh, I was watching a TV show. I'll, I'll wrap, wrap it up here. I was watching the ABC News the other night. Anybody see this gentleman who recently got released out of prison after 29 years of being in jail for something he didn't do? This is actually happening more and more now. They're starting because of DNA. <clears throat> this black gentleman, I think it's from uh, Tennessee or someplace, but he had been in jail for 29 years. They were looking for, I mean, he was a kid, he was just a young kid, like 18, 19 years old, and, and uh, someone was murdered, and they were looking for someone to blame, because that's what we do, you know, we gotta, we gotta, who's responsible for this, you know. So they, they, he was, he was uh, a comedian, and um, when it didn't add up, they begin to feed information to another man uh, who testified against him. Well, as time went on, and now because of modern science and stuff, and I don't know the whole story, but DNA stuff, and this other individual stepped forward and said, you know what, I was a kid, and they, they pressured me. I, again, I, I probably got my facts mixed up, but basically I was going to be persecuted in trouble, maybe arrested myself or whatever if I didn't testify, so I testified against this. Okay. 29 years. Imagine. Does that strike anybody else? Because for me, living in jail for 29 years for something I didn't do, that would be pretty, pretty hard. Pretty hard. So the great thing about this, the story was, um, they were filming this guy, he got out, and he was, there was a meekness about him. Because he had settled his heart for this. He could have been eaten up with anger and right, you know, bitterness. I mean, anybody had a right to be bitter against the system and against people and against his accuser, against the guy who testified, against the police? He went through that and processed through that. Do you have somebody in your life right now that you just need to, you just need to let it go? Somebody said that uh, bitterness is like drinking poison and expecting someone else to die. But for real, you need to let it go. You say, well, that's saying that what they did was okay. No, it's not. As a matter of fact, if it was okay, you follow my train of thought, you wouldn't have anything to forgive them. You get that? Okay? The actual, the act of forgiving them means they, they really actually did something wrong. So that thing in your mind that says, well, it's like saying they didn't do anything wrong. No. If they didn't do anything wrong, you wouldn't have anything to forgive them of. Jesus said it this way. He says, when you forgive, or he says, when you pray, pray, forgive us our debts. As we forgive those who are indebted to us in one translation. The word forgive means to release the hand. So the reason he used the debt analogy is because when someone does something to you, they do owe you. Okay? They do owe you. Legitimately, they do owe you. It is like a debt. God sees it like a debt. That's why he initiated the whole eye for eye, two for two thing as a foundational thing that eventually we would hopefully grow past. Because he wants you to know that when you do something against someone, there should be some retribution. On a legal basis, there should be payback. Our law system still works that way, doesn't it? And there is an indebtedness. When you steal from someone, they, you're supposed to pay them back. When you hurt somebody, there's supposed to be retribution for that. That is a lower form of justice and judgment, isn't it? Okay? But he said, when you forgive, what you're doing is you're saying, you don't owe me anymore. You're not saying there never was a bill. You're writing pay at the bottom. You get what I'm saying? You're canceling it. You're not saying it didn't happen. You're saying, you owe me this. I say you owe me nothing now. In other words, you're not waiting for him to come apologize anymore. You're not waiting for that phone call where they blubber and tell you how sorry they are. The debt is paid. The same way that Jesus paid. Aren't you glad that he did that for you? I mean, that's kind of the concept. Jesus told the story, he says, you know, about the guy who was forgiven this huge amount of money and then he went out and found his friend that owed him like 10 bucks. 
and he drew the jail for it. He said, oh, really? Really? You enjoy this forgiveness that you, could, that you don't deserve at all, and you can't give that to somebody else? So, that's the cross, too. I'm just like way off subject here, but maybe not. Okay? All right, so... Okay, let's just read these real quick. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Galatians 6.14 God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and out of the world. When you embrace the, world, the cross, you start on a pilgrimage. Remember the song we sing, This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Anybody used to sing it? My treasures are laid up. You know, we, the idea of being pilgrims. Okay, Petra. There's aliens, strangers. I mean, uh, that's, that's still not even close enough. Culturally, is it? The Bible teaches that we are not of this world, that we are pilgrims going to another land. And that's what Paul is saying. When I embraced the cross, it was it crucified the world to me and me to the world. I'm not a citizen. He actually said it that way. He said, We are citizens of another world. It's in there. Philippians 2 8 brings humility and obedience. And being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. The cross will create humility and obedience in your life when you embrace the cross. Uh, Philippians 3.18 For many walk of whom I have told you often and now even tell you weeping that there are enemies of the cross of Christ. The cross has enemies. The enemies of the cross are basically those who say live for yourself. You see the cross is you can't live for yourself. And you, you see the cross is the ultimate selfless act. It's the ultimate. And Jesus lived the cross for 33 years before he embraced the wooden cross. He did not live. He says, I came not to be served, but to serve. And in the end, to give my life a ransom for many. His whole life was about selfless living for others. See, there's a great, great benefit in living for others. There really is. He that would be greatest among you, do what? Let him be the greatest servant of all. He that would be the greatest among you has to be the least. He that would be a ruler has got to be a servant. There's great benefit in that. Uh, Colossians 1.20 And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Peace comes through the cross. You need peace in your life? Go back to the cross. You're feeling like peace has been under attack in your life? Come back to the cross. Everybody goes through that. I go through that. Everybody goes through challenges over your peace. Here's the answer. He makes peace through the blood of his cross. Come back to the cross. Say, Lord, I'm coming, I'm kneeling at the cross. I like to sometimes come and kneel and envision myself kneeling at the cross of Jesus. I believe he takes that seriously when I do that. Colossians 2.14 the cross fulfills the requirements of the law. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. It's talking about the, again, the 630 ordinances. He says he takes them and he nails them to the cross. Why? Because they are fulfilled through the law of love. Last one, Hebrews 12, so we read it already. The cross brings endurance and it needs endurance. Looking unto Jesus... The author and finisher of faith, I love this scripture. Everything we do is about looking unto Jesus. Every second of your life is about what's coming. Do you know what's at the end of your journey? It's Him. It's Him. I mean, really, what more would you like at the end of your journey than this faith? I mean, really, come on. I want to call well, bless you, the Lord. I want a nice house. I would like a nice house. But at the end of my journey, I want him. Looking unto Jesus. Now, if you, if you read Hebrews, it's talking about the race that we're running. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfect of our faith. Who, you know, the Lord will never ask you to do what he doesn't do himself. Who for the joy that was set before him. So what was out in front of him? He's out in front of us, Right? We are looking unto him at the end of the race. What was he looking to at the end of his race? I know it's hard to believe, but it's you. Yeah? 
says, you know what my prize is? It's my brother. Come on. I, I know that is that was the hardest thing for me to wrap my mind around. You are the prize. What is it? What else would it be? What do you get the man who has everything? He said, it can't be that. It is that. 